Welcome to the Maverick Podcast. I'm your host, Kathy Rose, and a big shout out to all the free spirits out there, all the free thinkers. Um, I love you, and I love all the emails you send to me uh, appreciating the Maverick perspective. Well, we have a wonderful Maverick today to talk to. Her name is Victoria Shaw. She is an intuitive counselor um, and a spiritual coach. She has her PhD in psychology, very gifted woman. Come on board, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to reconnect. It was so much fun having you as a guest on my show. And um, I'm really excited to continue our conversation. Yes, I should say, um, Victoria has her own podcast, The Intuitive Connection, very successful, lots and lots of episodes, and um, full of delightful information. You live and breathe intuition, spirituality, higher consciousness. And so you do this full time, right? I do. I do. And I have been for the past uh, 12 years. My math isn't great, but something around there. (laughs) So yeah, it's, it's my purpose and calling and also my, my fun and my joy. Mm -hmm. So um, your client base calls you for spiritual guidance, but I suppose they also call you so that you can help them open their own intuition and use it more actively in their life. Absolutely. And I mean, I do a lot of teaching. I do teaching through the podcast. I do teaching through classes, both online and in person here where I just relocated to San Diego. So I love teaching people to connect with their intuition because obviously the kind of work that you and I do, we're the, we're the conduit, we're the channel, but the goal is to help people access their own wisdom, right? It's not what I know. It's me helping you know what, what's already true within you. Um, I find too, that even when people come to me for guidance, or even they come to me for traditional counseling, whenever we're in that space of intuition, and I'm, I, I do my very best to vibe there is, you know, most of the time, particularly when I'm working, there's a resonance. And so I find that it awakens naturally for my clients. It's just when you start to set that intention, when you start to know intuition is a thing, when you start to listen to podcasts like this and read books and just open yourself up to it, be around people that are vibing with it, you know, your own intuition, it just, it just kicks into high drive. Yeah. And I love how you phrase that, that are vibing with it because it is a frequency. Yes. It's a particular frequency and those who are sensitive can feel when it's happening. But, you know, we've been using it our entire life. Everybody yes. has intuition, everybody. Yes. And it becomes, you know, for some of us, it becomes so normal that we don't even know we're using it. And, and I find a lot of women have that all the time anyway. Yeah. And I've been shown sometimes. So one of the, the ways that I can use my intuition is I can see how other people experience theirs. So it makes it real helpful for teaching because it's different for everybody. Everyone experiences their intuition differently. So for me to teach you what I do, it might be like a little bit of a useful kind of rubric for you to start, uh, but it could be completely different for everyone. And so sometimes I'll look at someone and I'll see a particular gift that they have. And we all come with these unique gifts and you know, I'll be like, that's your intuition. They'll be like, no, that's just, that's just the thing that I do, (laughs) you know, because we, we often take it for granted. And so when we kind of understand, no, like that's, that's your special sauce that you bring to the world. That's, that's your soul speaking through you. I I think it, I think it, it changes the way that we understand ourselves and and our, our mission and purpose here on on earth. So yeah, it definitely opens up, opens up more information. I mean, I, I find that often people who are using the gift, what I call psychic prophecy and psychic prophecy, isn't necessarily seeing the future, but it's a knowingness. It's a super fast, instant knowingness, nothing to back it up. Um, It's so natural, but it's so quick and it's so automatic and it's so effortless. Many times people invalidate it because they think intuition has to be flashing lights, you know, the hallelujah chorus, crashing symbols, You know, that has to be some phenomenalistic thing, but it's something we've already integrated into everyday life. Absolutely. And intuition is often very subtle. It's, I mean, there are times in my life when boy, it's like hitting you over the head with a fry pan, but most of the time it's very, very subtle. And the trick is to sort of quiet down and, and trust it and to listen to it. And I like what you said too, because it's happening all the time. It's happening all the time for every person in a body, no matter if you consider yourself spiritual or not, or high vibing or not, or whatever, our guidance is always communicating with us. It's always guiding us. 
And so it just becomes about learning to listen because most of us have actually been taught explicitly to ignore it. That is what most human conditioning is, is teaching us how to ignore what our soul is telling us all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as an astrologer, when I look at a horoscope with somebody who has a very active mercury statement or a lot of air signs, these are people who tend to intellectualize their intuition away. They'll get the signal and then they'll think it through logically and then they'll invalidate it. And I continue to say, do the reverse appreciate the fact you've got a signal and assume it's accurate and then logically think what to do from that point on. Yeah. There's really good research that I remember coming across in my early psychology days as an undergrad. Um, And the research was the idea is that when sometimes people know stuff, but when you ask them to think about it and explain their decisions, their decision making gets less accurate. (laughs) So this is actually documented, you know, and then they understand it in terms of the adaptive unconscious, um, you know, because this is early science before we got to talk about woo spiritual stuff um, that is changing now. But it's to me, that's it's the same thing. A lot of times when we think we are taking ourselves away from what we know and into what we think we should do, what we've been taught, what we've been really mistaught and away from our inner GPS system, which when we're listening to it is always 100% spot on. Mm -hmm. And some of the most intuitive people I've ever met are either artists, or musicians or athletes, especially athletes. I love athletes, because they're moving their physical body, and they don't have time to intellectualize what's happening, they have to do that super fast connection, and let those signals come through bypassing the brain and going right into the body. But I also think that those are areas where intuition is allowed and where it's encouraged in acting to some extent in arts, definitely, you know, elite athletes know I have to get out of my head. That's a thing. Um, Those people may, if they're making a decision about who to marry or which contract to sign, they may, you know, (laughs) they may go back to disallowing their inner knowing, right? Because those are areas where we've been told to think it through. So I think that those are places where people more naturally connect because they've been taught that it's okay and it's, it's normalized. That's an excellent point. Yeah. It's an excellent point. It's developing the habit of that automatic slide through, you know. Now, I'm sure you know about synesthesia. Yes. Um, do you ever experience it? I experience it quite a bit. I always have. It became stronger when I actively started to make mandalas. And I find people with synesthesia tend to just naturally be open intuitively because it's, you know, it's such a creative process. I love it. I don't experience it. I've had clients that experience it and it sounds amazing, um, but it is not an experience that I have. So <laughs> do you believe people can develop it? Because I do. I've, I've oh, trained sure. some of, yeah, because when you read about it, you'll hear or you'll read that only some people have it. You're either wired for it or you're not. And you know, I've taught a lot of astrology through the terms of synesthesia, and I've had a lot of people open up to it. You know, for example, um, I did a questionnaire to find out if there were certain signatures astrologically that might indicate who would be naturally wired to synesthesia. And I asked questions like, if happiness was a color, what color would it be? So if I were to ask you that, if happiness was a color, what color would it be? Today is orange. Orange. Today is orange. I like that. <laughs> I don't know what it would be tomorrow. It might change. Yeah. <laughs> I liked what my son said. He said, it would be a rainbow. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think we can learn to do anything that we, we mm-hmm. want to. And just, you know, we all come to earth and the same thing with intuition. We all come to earth with our natural inclinations. For me, my intuitive signals were all tuned on, turned on from the moment I came out of the womb to my detriment because I was overwhelmed and I grew up in a very toxic environment. So it was, you know, it was TMI, it was too much. And a Mm -hmm. lot of my journey has actually been learning to recalibrate Mm -hmm. to just the highest signals and to turn, turn down everything else. Right. Um, Other people, the way that they awaken their intuition is actually to turn up the volume because they've had it so quiet, you know, and so they really need like to to blast it so they can start hearing it. Right. But 
we all we all come in with our proclivities. We all come in, you know, this you're an astrologer. We all come in with our natural gifts, but we can always grow in whatever direction we choose to. And um, you know, when I teach intuition development, though, I do teach people start with what's happening for you already. Because oftentimes people want the big bells and whistles. They want to do what I do or what other people do. And they're discounting that it's already happening for them and that their soul and their spirits already communicating in a particular way and start there. Always start with what, what's natural to you and you will grow from there for sure. But you know, what's already happening for you, that's already like a little glimmer of your soul's special sauce, right? And you want to share that. Exactly. Yeah. Some people will experience intuition through feeling, which would be a bodily sensation. I don't particularly get that. I get things through vision. So I will get a lot of information visually as a picture, or when I look at a person or, or imagine something in my mind, other people get the knowingness. And then there are those um, who get it through words, or I call it psychic audience, which is right. the voice in the head or the language based intuition. And they're the people who say, your voice sounds funny today, or what aren't you saying, you know, right. because they get it through hearing, right? Yeah. It, yeah. And for me, when I first the first intuition development class I took was very visual. And you see, I'm vis- I have the visual sense now, but it's not the first one to develop yeah. for me, I have a strong sense of knowing, I feel energy. And, and I'm clear audience. So I hear mm-hmm. my guidance and I, I hear people's voices. I'll remember your voice. If I've met you before, I, you know, I might not remember your face or your name, but I, if I talk to someone on the phone twice, I'll know their voice, which is mm-hmm. not, I've been told very common. So for me, that first class was just maddening because they were, first of all, they were all anti empath. So they were like, turn down your second chakra. Don't feel anything, but I'm kinesthetic. So I feel energy. I feel shifts in energy. That's how I get information. So that was a little confusion. And then again, too, everything was visual, but my strongest ways are my knowing and my clear Mm -hmm. audience. So it was great for me because I learned that early out of the gate, I had to do it my way and that, you know, what works for one person. And when I teach, I teach visual cues as well, because some people, a lot of people I think are very visual, but that just wasn't the first thing that opened up for me. Mm -hmm. Hear, see, know, and understand. Yeah, whichever one exactly. works for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it can be multiple. And I have found along my journey now I'm much more visual and I do get visual cues and I do get visual imagery. It just wasn't the first thing and it's not my go-to. Yeah. One of my friends, um, Pete Sanders Jr. I've had him on the podcast several times. Uh, he has an organization called Free Soul, which is a nonprofit public education program in Sedona, Arizona. And I taught with that for many, many years. And we talk about gift order, psychic, the four psychic senses, and that people tend to have one or two senses that are their strongest ones, which is exactly what you're talking about. And it is very sad when people teach in only one psychic sense and cut everyone else out. And um, it ends up leaving people sort of wounded, feeling like their way is not okay. Exactly. And, you know, I teach the, the different senses. And I think that's a great rubric, but there's even more than that. There's even more than that. There's so many unique psychic gifts that people have. I've worked with teachers that have an innate sense of the group and they can feel into the group dynamic and they, they know they sense which whatever senses they're using, right. When one kid is like about to tip the the whole Mm -hmm. class towards, Mm -hmm. right. I've worked with, I, I actually, um, I can taste so I know mm-hmm. that's a rare one for a lot of people, but I get taste in my mouth and sometimes I'll get a taste in my mouth indicative of something, but also I'm someone who has a lot of food sensitivities, but if I go out to dinner with my spouse and he's having dessert, he doesn't like me to do this very much anymore. Cause it really bugs him, but <laughs> I can taste his dessert. He doesn't like it. Cause I'll taste his dessert. And then I'll ask him a thousand questions to see if I'm tasting it right. And yes, and he's- but that's a little bit of synesthesia. You're converting what you're, yes, you're reaching out and you're converting it through taste. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I can just taste, I can just feel mm-hmm. into what he's tasting or yes. what it tastes like, but yes. yeah. So, um, it's nice. Cause I can taste things that, you know, and sometimes it's very surprising. I'm like, I didn't think it would taste like that from the menu. And he's like, yes, in fact, it does not stop asking mm-hmm. me dumb questions. So I can have my dessert. See, and when I'm at a restaurant, I can look at the menu and as long as I see what's written on the menu, I can tune in and sense if it's the, a good dish, or I can get a psychic smell, or sometimes I get a ty- psychic taste. But yeah. I definitely, I, you know, have to read it and see it, not hear what the waiter is saying, I actually have to look at the words. 
And then I'll get the sense. Right. One of my gifts is I can go to any restaurant and pick out the best thing on the menu. <laughs> I'm going to try that. I think I just, it just happens for me naturally, but usually for me, it's like, there's only one or two things I can eat anyway. So (laughs) yeah. And I tell people the moment that you have an intuition and you don't listen to it and it turns out to be right. Don't kick yourself. Just remind yourself, wow, it was really working and record how it came in. What was the frequency? What was the signal? And then ask yourself, has that frequency or signal, has that type of signal come in in the past? And has it been accurate in the past? I mean, these are things that are so important to record when it was right, even if you didn't listen. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. you get so much, you get so much feedback. And the good news is we often remember the times that we didn't act more than the ones that we did. So those are the most powerful reminders of, oh, that was actually my intuition. Well, so often, especially for women, the conditioning and programming of being nice gets in the way of making a decision that is coming in intuitively where you would seem not nice. So that programming of I must be nice, I can't be rude. My intuition is saying no to this person, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, that's a huge one. I think that happens Mm -hmm. a lot, particularly with women and kids too are taught that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And from my psychological training, we actually tell parents not to teach our kids that because when you're talking, I'm not a big worry about sexual predators, but it's, it's a boundary thing. Anyway, you know, if you don't have a good vibe about someone, you're right. You know, you're right. You don't, it's not a judgment of them. It's not blaming them. It's not saying anything wrong with them. It's saying, this is not good for me. And, and that's, that's primal. That's so important. Yeah. And, and encouraging that men are given a little bit more permission to not be nice more than women, you know, women's identity. And I hope this changes someday, but you know, the socialized identity is around being accepted and being nice and being pleasant and not being rude. And it blocks so much power Mm. quite frequently. I agree. So, um, what are the first things that you do to keep your intuition strong? For example, I find what I do is become very, very active my, of my aura and my energy field. And one of the things I do on a daily basis is cleanse my aura, cleanse my energy field, um, consolidate it, create a strong boundary around it so that I'm not um, dragging around psychic debris from days earlier or um, emotional stuff, you know, that I actually cleanse it and refresh it. And I think that's one of the most important life skills. You know, if you check your hair and you check your clothes, why don't you check your aura, right? But what do you do? I don't do that, but that sounds like a great one. <laughs> For me, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty in touch with myself. So I'll know if I'm feeling off or if something's not right. And then I'll definitely tune in and ask my guidance, you know, what, what needs to be done about that. And I also think for me, it's keeping my vibration high and clear. So spending a lot of time, self-care is huge. Spending a lot of time doing what I love to do, making time for myself. Um, Meditating would be something I could do more, but I spend a lot of time walking on the beach. I spend a lot of time hiking. I spend a lot of time creating. I spend a lot of time doing things that feel good to me, that feel aligned with me. I listen to myself um, and I'm learning to do this more and more where something doesn't feel right. I don't do it if I have a choice. And oftentimes I do. So it's really for me about aligning with my spirit, which is my highest self, which is what brings me joy and spending a lot of time in my own vibration. It's important for me to, uh, to spend some, some alone time to recharge and regroup. And, um, you know, usually right now I'm living alone. So I get a lot of alone time, but when I wasn't, which was, which I wasn't recently, you know, it meant going out, being in nature, sitting by myself, meditating, um, so that I really connect back with me and my own true high vibration. And that for me is very healing and purifying and it gets the job done. You know, I have to mention something that you did and you did it unconsciously. Now for those people watching this on video, you will, once I bring it up, you will notice that she did it. But if you're listening audio only, let me describe, you took your hand and you passed it over the top of your head. First, you did your forehead, and then you kind of smoothed your hair with that okay. motion. One of the techniques that we talk about in the free soul course is that is a method of cleansing. Um, we call it intermediate cleansing, which, you know, your hand 
has energy flowing through it. And what you're doing in a sense, and people do this automatically without thinking, is you're sort of sweeping open that third eye chakra and the crown chakra. And often people will also then do it over the throat. But if you notice, if if you're watching um, a a stand-up comedian, if you're watching the pitcher on the mound of a baseball game, if you're watching people under stress, you know, they'll quite frequently just smooth their hair like that because it's just a quick pass to open up those chakras, to open up the inflow and outflow center um, of energy so that your aura poofs up. So what we talk about is that the crown chakra is kind of the inflow center. It flows in through the crown and out through the third eye. It goes down the spine, up through the front, and then out through the third eye. Right. But, you know, I watched you do it twice when we talk about, yeah, you're just automatically, and it's something you can do in public. And it's a great practical technique, especially if you do it mindfully. Um, Back in the day, when I was in my 20s, and I used to drive from Denver to Sedona all the time to go teach, and I would go straight through in my little Volkswagen bug. You know, that's back in the day when we didn't have cell phones to travel. And here I was, you know, 24, 25 years old, going by myself in a little bug, And this was a bug I used to have to um, push start. So if I stopped for gas, I would have to, you know, push start it because it had a problem. But at any rate, you you know, you didn't drink a lot of water. You didn't take coffee with you. And (laughs) those days were really incredible. But I remember every 15 minutes to half an hour, I would just do a quick cleanse, you know, sweep open the crown chakra, sweep open the third eye, because it was a 13 hour drive. And I would just go straight through no breaks except for maybe getting gas, but regular basis, cleansing and flushing that aura, you know, for students who are um, doing finals or a super strong um, study session, um, whatever it happens to be, if they would cleanse their aura more frequently, it would really, really help. Yeah. Well, I used to leave my body a lot when I was growing up, you know, same thing when you are psychically open and you're getting a lot of information, sometimes you just sort of leave your body. And I would do it at school, I would do it, you know, anywhere, anytime, and I would just sort of drift out of my body a little bit. And when that would happen, I would see things from very, very far away. It was a, a, you know, like when they have um, one of those weird lenses on the camera, and everything is distorted. And I think one of the things that's really nice now, is more and more parents are starting to be open to this stuff. And so I think more and more kids are going to grow up with that frame of reference to understand their experiences. I see that more and more just in my brief time practicing, um, which is not nearly as long as yours, but it's been such an evolution and the number of parents that, you know, they're interested in this stuff and they're interested in how do I help my kid connect with their intuition? So I I really do think we're, we're having a shift and a change. And even in, you know, when we talk about mental illness. I think there is a real fear around a lot of people based probably on some past life memories, but also just based on, you know, the way the world works. Wow. If I share some of these experiences with a therapist, or if I, you know, I'm going to be labeled as insane. I will tell you nowadays, the bar for insane is really high. And that a lot of people that are in the field that I'm in are very, very open. (laughs) So (laughs) it, you know, it doesn't happen so much anymore. I think people are getting much more positive feedback when they do open up. I mean, it's not true for everyone all the time. The world is still worldy sometimes, but um, I feel more and more, there's so much openness and accepting of the fact that we all do have a sixth sense and there's nothing weird about it at all. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be sensationalized. We don't have to bimble off to woo woo land. You know, it's very practical and it's very normal. It's hunches and maverick mentality. People, I think, are very open to their hunches. If you look at the maverick personalities, these are people who operate on hunches or the flash of inspiration, and they tend to take action right away. You know, it's an embrace of this. Look at the big mavericks in the world who have really become very, very successful. And then you know, other mavericks who live in the maverick mentality, but don't have the path of huge monetary success. They just have more life success. Yeah, it's incorporated. And I think our kids are going to, um, well, because you know, I certainly raised my kids with an awareness of that. And each new generation does. But, you know, fortunately, we haven't had parents who have gone through a war nearly as much as my parents 
and their parents, you know, and the hardships they went through with World War II and the Depression and, and then Vietnam, you know, and that, that, that creates so many wounds in the parents that sometimes they shut down and they project that onto their kids. Yeah, that has been a thing for sure. Yeah, so it's, there's a huge change, I think. Now, you delved into past lives quite a bit too, right? I do. I love past lives. Um, I was shown some of mine early on in my journey. And uh, at first I didn't believe them. My husband actually believed, you know, he would see these recurring scenes in his dreams of places that he knew he had been, but he hadn't been in this body. And he always believed in past lives. And I thought it was a little weird. I was like, okay. And, uh, but I, uh, he had an idea. I was working on a screenplay for a while because he had a dream that was really cool. And, and I was looking for something to do. So I did all this research on reincarnation, um, but I still wasn't, I wasn't quite a believer. And, and then when I started my own spiritual journey and I started being shown these lifetimes and it resonated deeply that's when things sort of shifted for me. And then also as soon as I started doing my own work, I would see past lifetimes for clients. Mm -hmm. So I am now a believer and a fan. And, you know, the way that it works for me uh, in the work that I do is they come up spontaneously when there's something matching from a past lifetime. Um, And some people think everything's happening at once. So it might might all be parallel, but from another body or, or perspective that you're, Oversoul has experienced um, that's relevant now. And so I always encourage people to stay in the now um, because sometimes, you know, we want to personalize our past lifetimes too. And I, I remember having a client and all these lifetimes, she was, she was really struggling with her, her sense of, of power in a female body. And so she was having all of these lifetimes, you know, come up of being an empowered female, often a child. And one day she was thinking about going back to art school. And one day this lifetime came up of her as like this artist in Paris, a male artist in Paris, who was just having a great time feeling free and enjoying. And she goes, wait, I haven't always just been a disempowered girl. Like she, and, and it was like a light bulb for me because I realized, wow, you know, she's personalized these past lifetimes rather than realizing that oftentimes you know, similar energies and threads and experiences will show up so that we can clear them in the now. Exactly. And, right. And we're really a conglomerate of lots of different experiences. And I've had some people remember past life experiences that their soul didn't even have. Yeah. But true story. So um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a mind bender, but, um, but so I just look at them as, as it just helps us understand what we're doing now. And sometimes I've had a life challenge where, I'll understand a past lifetime that led me to choose this experience now. Cause I feel our soul on some level, your human might not be choosing, but on some level, your soul is always making a choice. And that choice is because your soul feels that there's some growth or expansion that will come through this experience. And I'll be shown a past lifetime where that led me to the experience I'm having now, mm-hmm. which will totally, and, and I get this for clients too, but I'm just thinking about me, um, <laughs> which will totally frame what, how I'm being called to respond to the situation, because sometimes our brain will tell us one thing, but our soul has a very different idea. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I offer therapeutic past life sessions and I've done Mm -hmm. that for years and years. I don't advertise it that much. I'll go through waves where all of a sudden I'll advertise it. And then I pull back a little, but in the therapeutic past life sessions, what I do is tune in to their soul and their Akashic records and ask my guides to show me the lifetimes that are most relevant for what they are working on in this lifetime. And then I get these vignettes. I'll get a series of vignettes. And what I'm looking for then are the themes that come through. And yeah, exactly what you said, which is we attract things in this lifetime that have a similar frequency to poke those bruises so that we get a chance to heal them. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, what happens too, and you'll see this happen in your own life as well, probably, when you're working on something, you'll see that same theme come up again and again. And, and I was thinking about this the other day, cause it's very interesting. Cause it goes in one of two directions. One direction is it amplifies, right? You're not getting the memo. And so the problem gets louder and louder and louder and louder until you're like, okay, fine. <laughs> but it, right. And a lot of people are familiar with that one. That's the fry pan over the head again. Right. Like I didn't hear that memo. And then all of a sudden now, you know, I, I get into a car crash or, you know, my job, I lose my job because, because you're just not listening. And it is okay. When this happens to you, you've done nothing wrong. 
You've done nothing wrong. It's just life trying to communicate with you and it's always here to help you. But the other direction I see it in is the other way, which I think is fascinating where, you know, it'll start off kind of high and, and it will each time you'll experience it again, but it will lose some of that intensity. And I think that a lot of times, especially with older souls, this happens where we, we have had some really big boomer lifetimes with a lot of intensity. And now we have learned a lot from them. And now we're choosing to re-experience some of those things in, in, in a safer Mm -hmm. context so that we can explore it with more nuance and more consciousness. And desensitize from the trauma. Exactly. And become present while it's happening and to integrate it differently. Exactly. And you'll see both of these patterns in your, within a life, but also across lives. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And I don't think that it is important to sensationalize the past lives. So many people do that. They go in and they try to sense past lives and they go, okay, you know, I need to know what year, what, what place on the earth I need to have all these details. And I think, no, you just need to know the theme. What's right. the theme. I think it's the same thing as, you know, some mediums are great evidential mediums. And they will give you tons of very specific information about the deceased loved one that makes you feel like, okay, they're really talking to this person. I'm not that kind of medium, right? Uh, If I'm giving a session and a deceased loved one wants to come in, sometimes all they're going to say is exactly what they tell mediums not to say. I'm okay. I'm safe. I love you. It's not your fault. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Because that's Um, the most important message. Right. And sometimes it's more nuanced, but again, most people that come into my office kind of already believe in this stuff. So I get to skip that step, Mm -hmm. but I am so in awe of the people that have that gift. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with past lives. I interviewed someone from my show who's a history buff and a medium and gets past lifetimes. And so she will get, Uh, and I, and I did a a reading, a co-reading with her in my Facebook group. So I can see she's amazing. Um, she will know exactly by looking at the information that re- she receives because she knows so much history. She'll know exactly when and where everything's occurring. I know other people that get numbers, they get a year mm-hmm. number for me. I'm more of a just kind of girl and I don't know any history. So sometimes I surprise myself by knowing history that I didn't know. Cause I Google it afterwards. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I see you in Japan, but this thing is happening. Did that thing happen in Japan? And they're giving me this year. And then, you know, it's, it's validating when I find out that those little threads line up. And ultimately it boils down to trusting self, trusting that we are capable of getting this information. I'll never forget. um, Sometimes a past life signal will interrupt a consultation. And this was years ago and I had a consultation and I was talking and I kept smelling bourbon and I kept seeing an alligator belt and, and I smelled cigarettes and I kept saying, this is the most bizarre thing. We need to interrupt what's happening here because I keep smelling bourbon and seeing an alligator belt and I, I'm smelling cigarettes. And she just gasped and started to cry. And she said, um, when she was a little girl and she was at the height of her dad's belt and he wore an alligator belt and he was an alcoholic and drank bourbon all the time and had, you know, a major cigarette smell. And that happened right when we were talking about one of her core life purpose issues about not feeling worthy and feeling criticized, which came from her father because she was abused. And wouldn't you know it, the signal comes through where I pick up his spirit and feel him and smell him. So psychic smell can also happen. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I get that one as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes you don't want it. (laughs) <laughs> no, <laughs> just give me the good smells. Thank you very much. Yes. You know, now yeah. you can also use this with animals. You can also use this with babies. When I was nursing my children, because I nursed for a long time, nursing was very, very important to me. And one way to open up a mother's intuition is to nurse your child because that direct contact gives you all the information you ever need about what is happening with that precious little baby. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think we kind of, if we tune into it, that's one of the most natural conduits for intuitive knowing is with our kids, because Mm -hmm. that one's just set up from birth, but we have to tune in. And a lot of times we don't. Yes. And, and you don't have to nurse. It could be a father giving the baby a bottle. Of course, you know, it's not as much contact physically on the body, but it is still contact. And it's the same when you pet an animal, you pet your dog, you pet, 
pet your your cat that you love, 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 you know, you're feeling what the animal is feeling. You're sensing it. You're getting it through your intuition. You're communicating. And something my intuition is wanting to share now, which is something um, I knew, but I haven't really uh, had it framed this way before, but there's, there's something very healing when we are seen and understood through that intuitive lens, when another person is, I always, always tell people this, that, you know, when I give someone a reading, it's a healing. It doesn't even matter what comes through. It's that my soul, my higher self is connecting with yours. And that is so healing for us. And I was thinking about how that mother's intuition is that first opportunity for us to be seen in human form through that lens and how often, you know, so many of us have missed that because the, our caregivers did not have that ability. Did, and they had the ability, but they, they didn't have the permission to connect on that yeah. level. And so often authority bias gets in the way for sure. um, women, for some women, authority bias is so strong. For example, if your kid gets sick and authority bias is a problem, you may not trust what you're sensing about yeah. whether to take the child to the doctor or not, because you're giving all of your power away to the authority yes. instead. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. That's a big, that's a big one in our world, uh, particularly with medical doctors that are trained to uh, tell us that we have to listen to them. I remember my mom once knew I had a, a strep throat. She had had rheumatic fever as a child and it was, mm-hmm. a, and her, it was a long family thing or scarlet fever rather. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, um, it, it was always like, you know, every, and I would always get these viral sore throats. It was always a big deal. And uh, one day she looked at my throat and she's like, nope, that's different. That one's a strap. And she went to the doctor and she's like, it's a strap. And the doctor was like, how do you know? It was a strap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we all got it. Yeah. See, I would like doctors who go, thank you, mom. I believe you. Exactly. Exactly. And there's some out there too. I had an amazing pediatrician and he would a hundred percent listen to that intuition and also Mm -hmm. was very helpful at uh, discerning between the intuition that we often bring to the table and that just good old fashioned mom paranoia. I've been Googling too much (laughs) fear and, and gently, you know, unclasping my hands from, you know, around (laughs) release, relax. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Back in the day before Google, when, you know, the, it seemed like the signals were stronger because we didn't have that yes. you know, ability to go research it online. Yeah. It required it's not an ability. a different level of trust. <laughs> yeah. It's not an ability. My poor little guy, uh, my son, 20 something just got chicken pox, uh, in France because apparently they don't vaccinate for it there. It's still floating around. And somehow he had a breakthrough, uh, infection, but you know, he's calling me and he's telling me like, this is going to happen. And that's going to, I was like, you need to not look at the internet, my friend. Yeah. It's going to be a very mild case. You are in really good health. You are fine. You know, everyone in my generation survived it. And he, he is on the mend. But. Mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> but, Self-fulfilling but boy, prophecy. Apparently, I know. If you Google chicken pox, it's not good. I was like, really? Because everybody had it. <laughs> what an interesting generation we are in, though. Yeah. Living by Google. Yeah. You know, automatic living by Google. And then we think of the small children right now and what's coming for them. Very, so different. I'm older than you are. So, you know, of course I was a latchkey kid um, and I had to live by instinct because I had no parental guidance. Um, It was off you go, go take care of yourself. I mean, I, we used to have to stay home by ourselves if we were sick because mom was working, dad was working. You and know? can you imagine, I know today someone would be calling uh, social services. Yeah, it's a different time. But I also think that our spirits will work with the raw material of the time that we're given. Yes. So sometimes, you know, there are definitely ups and downs. And I think we're in a very we're in particularly turbulent times at the moment, for sure. Um, but there isn't a judgment around it. You know, sometimes we think, oh, the world is getting worse and this is terrible. And, you know, you are, you are the world is always showing us collectively what we need to work on, what the themes are activated, because those are the, the themes that the bodies on this planet are, are working on together. Uh, but it's also, it's, it's just going to shift and change. And your spirit kind of has an idea before it hops into your body, what those themes are going to be. And if you look at it, like the raw material of, you know, what you're going to play with or, or how this improv is going to go. I think it helps take some of the punch out of it. And also some of the judgment that we sometimes make when we, you know, we think like, you know, oh my God, Google. And and Google's also amazing. The the fact that we can communicate with each other so quickly now 
you know, it's a little like uh, telepathy, right? Yeah. And it's not going <laughs> so, away. It's here to stay. Yeah. It's going to probably be a little more until we learn that we can just do it without the devices. At exactly. All. But during these turbulent times, it's an even more important period to cleanse your energy field because some people will pick up on what other people are feeling, but then there's yeah. a big group of people who pick up on the collective psychic yeah. pressure. Yes, you yes, know, yes. And, and they'll, they'll feel the waves. I mean, I live close enough to DC. I'm on the East coast in Virginia beach that when something big happens in DC, I feel it wafting here. Oh, for sure. I remember I lived in New York city for uh, 12 years as a very sensitive empath and not so awakened or enlightened as I am now where I, I know about it, the stuff. I mean, I always had the gift and I always knew it was a thing, but I didn't understand it. I just knew, you know, like when my friend had her baby, my stomach hurt too. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Like maybe something that's not so great, but (laughs) what I would realize in New York, I could feel the energy. So before a snowstorm, right. You could feel the energy of everybody and it would be contagious. Suddenly you would be like, I have to buy milk. I have to buy, I don't drink milk, but I have to have some now. And so it was a real learning experience to me to be with that much concentrated human energy. And I was in New York uh, for 9-11 as well. So in Manhattan, through all of that, my husband works in finance. So it was it was it hit and and it worked in that building. So we had a lot of uh, connection, um, not at the time, fortunately, but um, but it was it was really instructive to understand that, to understand those energies and, and to learn, even though I didn't have the, the mental understanding yet. But I think my spirit was starting to teach me how to learn to work with them. Oh, even then. for sure. That's a turbo yeah. boost. You know, instructive yeah. is an understatement. If you yeah. were in New York yeah. City at 9-11, I can't even drive through New York City. The psychic pollution pressure is so strong and there's nothing, I, you know, I, I don't have any yeah. judgment against New York. It's just, yeah, it bombards me too much. And I feel fried and scattered. What I do is I see things being fractured. It's too much visual. I, you know, it's a lot fractured. Mm -hmm. I move when I first moved there. So I I've lived, I, well, now I live on the West coast. So nowhere near New York, but I lived for most of my adult life within two hours of, of the city. So I I believe there was a calling for me to be Mm -hmm. around that energy for a good chunk of my life. Um, But I started off in graduate school and would go in for the day um, to do internships or stuff. I remember coming back from the city and like washing everything because <laughs> it was all so gross. And then I lived there. So you don't wash your clothes every day when you live there. But I also remember thinking like, you know, you have to shut down to live in New York mm-hmm. because there's so much stimulation. Mm-hmm. I also realized once I was there, you know, walking two blocks is a very different experience than walking two blocks, say in California, because again, there's so much stimulus. And I will say too, when I left the city after 12 years and moved to Connecticut, there was a detox period where I had to get used to a lower level of stimulation, which is when my intuition opened up for me. Um, I feel that, you know, the New York kind of charged me. And then when I released that charge, that's where everything changed. So I'm very grateful to her. And, um, you know, I, I, I love, the city. And I feel, you know, I feel like places have identities and and we are definitely dear friends, but um, I I would probably never choose to live there again. Yeah. Places do have identities. They have certain signature frequencies about them. hundred percent. And you learn to ride the waves and you learn to choose what waves to ride. Yeah. Well, you have a few, you have two or three books, isn't that correct? Oh, I do. Those are, those are old. (laughs) old, 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 but yeah, um, they are not on anything that I do there. I mean, mm. anything I do now, um, but they are books. So um, yeah, they're got they're any future books, books in you. I hope so. I recently finished, actually, I finished it a while ago, but we're recently packaging it into something. I just did a sleep book for kids, mm. um, which is sleep tools. So that's going to be really fun. And I do think writing will happen again. Uh, I, I have lots of ideas. I actually, the podcast came about in a funny, funny way. I really felt like, and, and my entire life, I've always been a writer. I've loved to write, but I've had a dry spell. And I always saw myself writing uh, self-help books, popular fiction. I didn't really think spirituality at the time, but for as long as I can remember, that's, that's why I went into academics. I was going to write popular psychology and that was all I ever wanted to do. So I know it's coming because mm-hmm. uh, I, I tend to, tr- so far, all of my other life dreams seem to have, uh, I found their way to me. 
but the, the podcast is a funny story because I, I took, it was, I think, uh, 2019, maybe, uh, I can't remember, but I took a weekend off away from my family, got a place at the beach and was like, I'm going to start writing my book. I'm going to start writing. It's just going to come through. I got the call. I sit down, I sit down at the computer, nothing comes, nothing, not a <laughs> zip. So I go for a walk on the beach and, you know, I, I have my phone with me I, and I just kind of felt like talking. So I put the little record thing on, I start talking into the phone and all this amazing stuff is coming out. Like amazing, amazing. Like, I'm just like, wow, who knew I knew this stuff? I didn't, it was my guides, but whatever, mm-hmm. it was the bomb. And so I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'm supposed to dictate the book. So I went for some more beach walks. I listened, I started to try to write it down, nothing. And so it was like uh, maybe a couple of weeks later when I was a guest on a podcast that I realized that right now spirit was calling me to speak mm-hmm. and to get that channel going. So that's what I've been doing for the last uh, two years and loving it. But I do feel that uh, the writing is starting to flow again. So once again, my guest, Victoria Shaw, her podcast is The Intuitive Connection. You can find that on probably all the streaming services, right? And what is your uh, website? VictoriaShawIntuitive.com. Wonderful. In case anybody wants to get an appointment with you, get some coaching, some intuitive uh, counseling going on here. I'd love that. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the good you're doing in the world. It's been my pleasure. You You are um, a wonderful intuitive maverick doing great things in the world. Appreciate it. Thank you. Likewise. And it's amazing to reconnect with you, my friend. And we'll say bye for now because it's not going to be bye forever. I'm sure I'll have you back on. I would love that. Likewise. Okay. Bye for now then. 